What is up, you guys? My name is BJ Kicks, and I want to welcome you to The Hangout. This is a live stream we do every Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, where we talk about comics and whatever else, you know, comes to mind. Uh, so, like I said, we do this every Thursday at 7 p.m. If you're watching on the replay, just want to say thank you. I appreciate it because who wants to sit and watch me ramble for an hour and a half uh, if I'm not live, but you're here, so you're the real MVP. Um, and if you are watching live, thank you so much. Uh, give me a what's up in the chat so I can shout you out. I see Comics Kings is here. What's up, Brando? Uh, C Rook <laughs> is across the pond. He says this is airing on April Fools for him. That's hilarious. Uh, Zoe's here. I uh, just saw the giveaway stuff. That's awesome. Hope you're good. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Djax is on point five all the time. Tip, that's what's up. That's what's up. Um, good to see you guys. Um, but yeah, so if you're watching the replay, hopefully you can catch us live one of these days. Uh, tonight we actually have some special guests. I have a couple of special guests um, who will be joining us in just a few, as you saw on the title and the thumbnail. So I'm really excited about that. Um, if you see me clicking around, I'm just checking my messages to make sure that everything is all good. Um, but yeah, so C Rook won't be able to stick around the whole time. It's all good. That's the beauty of YouTube replays, right? Um, I understand, man. It's been a it's been a long week. It's been a long couple of weeks for me. Um, hilarious. <laughs> As I say that, Shevlin says, uh, how's your week? Have you seen Moon Knight episode one yet? I've watched it watched it twice uh press play on it last night i was dozing i was dozing off so i was falling asleep so i didn't really get much out of it last night i tried watching it again a few minutes ago um and i'm i was i was trying to multitask and you can't multitask while watching a show about a guy with multiple personality disorder uh because you you'll be just as lost as the subject of the show uh, so that's what I'll say on that. Um, I mean, I did hear the whole episode, but I don't think I've fully got the experience. So I'm definitely going to have to watch it again. Um, we've had insane things. So, okay, Brian's here. Uh, I see him backstage. We'll talk. I'll bring him up in just a second. But um, yeah. So it's already been a crazy week, you guys. I, you guys know, I did my first whatnot sale on Monday. <laughs> Uh, sold off all my Milestone Comics duplicates and whatnot is not working like they the shipping labels would not generate for me. So I've been on email support with whatnot all day trying to get these shipping labels so I can get these packages out to you guys. Um, and then as if that wasn't enough, we had a tornado come through my hometown. So we, there was a tornado warning at like four o'clock. So <laughs> I had my daughter's hold up in the half bathroom in the hallway uh, and we just kind of stood watch for dumb long so anyway the point is it's been a crazy day on top of an already crazy week i cannot wait for the weekend once we get to 5000 subscribers i might take like a week and a half off or something it's been it's been wild it's been wild um but now before i bring our guests on cuz we do have guests so i can't ramble all day um i do have to give a quick shout out and pay some bills so thanks so much to ultimate comics uh for sponsoring the hangout uh, you guys know if you watch the channel ultimate comics is my lcs they've got four locations in the raleigh area and if you live here chances are you've heard of them because they're the biggest shop they've got the cleanest stores the most organized shelves but you know you might not live here which honestly is the only excuse in my mind for you not to have shopped there yet so you can go to ultimatecomics.com shop rare and exclusive variants or shop twice a week on the Ultimate Comics live show. Uh, so without further ado, I do have a special guest in the building or, you know, on the internet. Um, you guys have heard me talk about his series, Black Cotton, but this guy is an independent writer um, and comics editor. Um, we're going to talk about his journey in comics, uh, the story of Black Cotton, and probably a whole lot more. So please welcome to the Hangout, Mr. Brian Hawkins. Hey, what's up? What's up? Not much, man. How you doing? Doing good. Doing good. Um, Patrick is on his way. He's going to join us. Okay. Um, so I'll send him the link and everything. But hey, that, that was a 
great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks for joining. Um, I have to tell you, tell the audience how we met or e met, right? So right. I did a review of Black Cotton. I think this would have been issue number one or two. Um, right. You guys in the K Squad, you know Kev. Kev costs. He's the one who like does not read any of the big two stuff. He's always looking for new indie series to put people right. onto. So he told me about Black Cotton. He actually sent me a copy of issue number one. That's cool. Because by the time I had heard about it, issue one was sold out everywhere. So he sent me a copy of issue number one um, and I subscribed to the rest. And so I did a review and Brian pops up in the uh, comments and he's like, yo, your boy Kev is dope for hooking you up with this. And we've been kind of chopping it up ever since. So um, thanks for showing the channel love, man. Oh, no doubt. I, I really like what you do. And you, you know, you're a content creator. So creators and creators. Um, and I definitely appreciate the support um, when it comes to Black Cotton and stuff. So um, it's all family here. All right, no problem. No problem. So um, while we're waiting for Patrick, there's a bunch of people here in the chat. So let's see. Zoe is sad about the state of comicsology. She only just discovered it before it got messed up. Uh, that, uh, yeah. yeah. I got lucky. I got lucky in that because I had been using Comixology on the web. I used Comixology Unlimited um, to check out a lot of stuff. Um, but I had just bought an iPad the week that Comixology announced all their changes. So by the time everything switched over on the website, I was using the iPad. But, I mean, even the iPad experience is like, it's been jacked up, but it's better. It's the it's the best of all the different platforms right now. Yeah, it's it's I don't I mean you have a good thing and then you know you mess it up somehow. I don't I don't understand, but right. That's just right. the way the world is, I guess. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> it's insane. It's been crazy. I don't I don't get like there was no need to mess with it. No, no. I I actually um like you know from from talking to everyone like I've heard about it. I actually haven't experienced it yet because here's what happened. Mm -hmm. I, they offered me the update and I had already heard it was all messed up. So mm -hmm. I kept the old version for as mm -hmm. long as I could. The old version kept running on my iPad right. until, until like maybe two weeks ago. Yep. And and then I tried to, <laughs> I tried to read something on the old version uh -huh. and it didn't upload. Like nothing, would move. it just stayed frozen. I'm like, really? Right. Are y'all gonna make me get this? Right. So yeah. So it's it's rough because what I loved about comicsology was discovering new books. Like they mm -hmm. would recommend a lot of stuff. And I was like, okay, cool. Now with comicsology, it's kind of like Marvel Unlimited, where you just gotta know what you want to read mm -hmm. before you try to pull it up. Um yeah. but before we get too deep in this, we do have another guest, um, the co-creator of Black Cotton, a comics writer. Um, and musician, if I'm not mistaken, he is. He is. So we, <laughs> right. So we've got Patrick Foreman here. Welcome to the hangout, sir. Welcome, welcome. How are you doing, Black Kind? <laughs> Black Kind. <laughs> I'm doing well, man. How are you? Hey, I can't complain. I can't complain. You know, I'm I'm always chasing Brian. So you know. <laughs> I am easy to be caught. <laughs> no road running, Wiley Coyote here. Right. <laughs> so uh call me Top Gun says uh W or cool hat as always, you guys still on a tornado watch. No, the tornado watch ended um sure. at like four thirty. And so then I went and tried to uh paste a bunch of shipping labels, mm -hmm. got confused, almost sent somebody the wrong package, and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna stop for the day and get ready for the live stream. That's what I'm like. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it beans like that sometimes. Right, sure. right. Sure. So, Brian and Patrick, I guess a great place to start this interview is like, how did you guys meet? <laughs> hey, hey I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell this story, Brian. We we normally tag team, yeah. you know, thing. So, um, me and Brian, we both have a mutual friend. Uh, his name is uh, Luke Wright. Uh, if you look him up, Luke Motivates, he has a book out, uh, The Right Thought, W-R-I-G-H-T, mm -hmm. uh, Thought. Uh, so me and him, we were going into prisons and speaking. He's a motivational speaker, and I have a magazine called uh, Returning Citizen Magazine. So we were, you know, in the prison in Maryland speaking, and uh, 
when we left, we were just hyped for some reason. It was just a great, you know, event, and we were hyped walking out. I was like, yo, I got this concept that I want to do as a comic book. Now, mm. I've been a comic book collector for years, mm. and, you know, it just been a comic guy. Walked okay. out, said that, and brought, uh, Luke was like, hey, well, I got a friend, you know, who's been in the comic game for a long time, you know, mm. while I introduce y'all. So we, <laughs> me and Luke, we had to do something at my church. So right after we, you know, uh, finished doing what we were doing at my church, this was uh, back in uh, uh, 2020, January 2020. Okay. So we went to eat and he made a phone call. And he was like, yo, Brian's gonna meet us. Brian, Brian's gonna meet us there. So now I'm really hyped. <laughs> so Brian showed up, you know, and uh it was Roadhouse, uh Texas Roadhouse. And what? he showed up, and from the beginning, I started telling him about the concept, and I was like, yo, even the cotton, you know, in this world, I said it's black. <laughs> right when right when I said that, he was like, yo, wait, wait, wait. That's it right there. Black kind. That's it. <laughs> and we went from, yeah. from lunch to my place. We started vibing right there. Mm. Went to my place, started building it out even more. And shoot, uh, October later that year, you know, we got signed to Scout. Yeah. But the beauty piece is the pandemic happened. Mm. So here it is, you know, you got Brian who I, I, I'll say it all the time, you know, a genius in his own right. If you don't know Brian Hawkins, you better latch on now because you're going to see more and more of Brian in the years to come. He's just, mm. he, he's a, he's a mastermind. So yeah. you got this time. mastermind who, linked up with this individual who has never written a comic book but he poured into me mm. and from the pandemic just helped free up time where he could really you know mold and show me and shoot man we were just a, a still you know best of friends and from day one and a, a great team you know from day one and here we go you know 10 months later Wow. <laughs> That's dope. I mean, I was very shocked to hear you say that you guys basically met January 2020. Because I'm like, I mean, Black Cotton's been coming out for about a year. Yeah. So, like, you that you guys go from lunch to a published book in a year. Like, that's wild. It really that's is. Wild. <laughs> um, true. Yeah, true that. So, for everyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, I, I should have I should have went and got my issues uh, ahead of time, but we're talking about black cotton and black cotton. I have several issues here. Um, it's this series from scout comics. Uh, these two gentlemen are the co-writers um, art is by Marco Perigini. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically this is a story um, set in like an alternate universe where the uh, race roles, I guess you would call them are swapped. So, you know, the black people are the majority, uh, white people are minority. And so all, everything you could think of, like as far as racism and prejudices and all of those things, you know, they're, they're, they're flipped, right? So uh, the series starts off with a bang, um, quite literally. So, <laughs> right. so uh, the main character, his name is Zion Cotton. Um, and Zion comes from a long line of, uh, basically successful black people. You could think of them like the Rockefellers or like the Rothschilds in, in the real world, right. right? Old money. Old money. And so for whatever reason, he decides not to join the family business. He decides he's going to be a police officer. And the book mm -hmm. starts off with Zion shooting an unarmed minority white woman. Um, and the series or at least the first volume, first six issues, kind of follows the fallout from this event. Um, and as each issue progresses, it 
I mean, on its head, on its face, it sounds like just kind of a racial story. And it's like, okay, well, you know, there is a certain level of subversion that you get just from flipping the race factor on it. But there's also like this really deep family story that you're getting as well. And you're getting um, a lot of, I don't want to spoil anything, but you're talking about like crisis management from old money to now. There's a lot of political themes. Like you could think of maybe something like, uh, maybe scandals taking it a little far, but you know, but, you know, I could think I, I'm thinking of like, you know, political drama where it's like, all right, we're going to do whatever we need to do to protect the family name, to keep secrets and, and so on. Uh, but there are still a lot of parallels to our world. Um, so I guess I'd want to ask you guys putting together a series like this. Um, you know, I'm one of few black YouTubers, um, uh, uh, we talk, uh, talk about comics pretty much exclusively. And when I jumped into this hobby, I kind of ran straight into like the comics gate crowd. It was like, I'd be looking for like comic reviews and the review would start off like, you know, a normal review. And then it would end with like, why are there so many black people in this book? Or like just crazy stuff. Or, like this book is racist and so on. Right. So entering this medium with this type of story, did you guys have any, concerns any any trepidation with bringing this to the forefront like this wow go ahead brian um <clears throat> we were we were well aware of um the climate that we were entering in i mean at the end of the day you know uh, the comic book industry um uh, you know to just speak speak mildly um you know it it can be a good old boys club mm -hmm. um, and then you know you have your milestones and you have your you know your preets um mm -hmm. and you have you know black creators that are that are there in the mix that, ha that has always been in the mix that has that have been telling their stories right mm -hmm. um and so we knew going in um with black cotton that you know this this was just a story that was supposed to be told and we were supposed to tell it. So while we were aware that, you know, of the climate, we also just felt the pull, we felt the call, the need to just go all in with it. And so concern, we didn't have any concern. We were just aware. Got you. Yeah. And just to, you know, add a little bit on to what Brian was saying, I think um, with that awareness, you really see, because one of the biggest uh, comments that we kept seeing reoccurring with the reviews is that uh, it's not preachy. Right? Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, something that we were very, very conscious of and aware uh, as we were writing, as we were, you know, going back over and editing. And we really was like, you know what? This isn't one of those books where we're trying to uh, get you to uh, get on our side with something or, you know, change your, you know, feelings mm -hmm. on a particular topic. No, what we went in understanding is this a uh, couple of things. We uh, here's what I'll say. Uh, two things. One was <clears throat> normally when individuals read a comic book is one on one meaning the comic book and them. So right. we began writing and understanding that when they first encounter words that we say or a topic that we display in the comic book, that the first dialogue they're going to have is with themselves. The right. first conversation they're going to have is with themselves. So we wanted to create a safe environment where they could, one, have that dialogue with themselves. And mm -hmm. what we've seen, even in conversations, you know, as such, just like with you, after an individual reads Black Kind, have that conversation with themselves, they actually have dialogue with other people different because of that right. pre you know conversation they had with themselves now it's not i'm not offended 
and I right. don't want to offend. So I come in a different way and more people have been able to have dialogues of conversations that normally are considered uncomfortable. Now they truly have a conversation um, and, and, and you can have empathy come from those conversations. You can have growth come from those conversations. You can have awareness come from those conversations and that's the end result of what we wanted you know, uh, black kind. We wanted to one entertain, but mm -hmm. at the same time, we wanted people to come away different. Got you. Um, so before I ask my next question, my man Kev is here. Uh, he's the guy that put me on the black cotton. Uh, he says, "Good evening, you guys." He's excited to see you. What's he that, says you've done a great job with the series. Uh, kudos to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, black cotton. Black cotton. Um, so now, Patrick, you said that when you and Brian met, you kind of had the concept for Black Cotton already. What was it that inspired it? Was there a, a certain event that inspired it? And then along with that, was there a, a goal that you had, that something you wanted to achieve with the series? Here, here, here's what I would say. Uh, we, the three of us, definitely can um, relate to this. Just being... Uh, of our, you know, culture, mm -hmm. we go through certain things and it's hard to explain to other cultures. And what I got sick and tired of seeing is it's nothing against the movies because a lot of them were great movies, but I thought they missed the mark on what they were truly trying to do. I feel that, like, for instance, we'll just say uh, a movie like 12 Years a Slave, you know, great movie. But guess what? If every movie you're trying to get a culture to develop empathy for another culture, but when I'm watching the, the movie, I'm in the weaker role or and they're always in the power role. Well, mm -hmm. it's hard for a person who sees themselves in the power role to truly develop empathy for, you know, the weaker role. I have to walk in those shoes. And mm -hmm. that's the beauty about uh, Black Kind. And what I also love, a lot of people don't know, you know, uh, Brian is in a interracial, you know, marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. So so we have, it's so beautiful yeah, because we have firsthand she loves black kindness she reads black kindness she gives us feedback true mm -hmm. honest feedback with black cotton and that's the piece the piece is that in order for individuals in order for me to even develop empathy for them and how they think and why they reacted the way they you know reacted I have to walk in their shoes meaning see myself also go through <clears throat> those scenarios and also see myself play out how they would play it out. And when mm -hmm. I see that, now I have some clarity and the same with them. If they walk in our shoes, they start seeing and understanding why we might say, do, or react the way we do. And once you have that, which uh, his, his, uh, <laughs> his wife, she says is a mind F, you know, mm -hmm. because- right you want to root for the people you relate to. Mm -hmm. You're trapped because you're like, but I don't look like them, you right. know? <laughs> right. So, so that's the beauty. And I just got sick and tired of um, continuously seeing things. For instance, I'll give you a perfect example and then I'll shut up how it starts. Uh -huh. um, everybody, as soon as it starts, they think Trayvon Martin, you know? Mm -hmm. But I've always said, if Trayvon was a female, would the outcome have been the same? Or would people have been saying that grown man was stalking a teenage, a minor female mm -hmm. been under the jail? If it was right. a female. But since it was a black male, all of a sudden now in the courtroom, they talking about where well, he looked like an adult. He was he was a kid, point blank. He was a kid. 
The, the, right. How can you? It doesn't matter what he looked like. Just like it wouldn't matter what she looked like if right. he had been a female. All they would have said was she was a female. Right. Like, right. So that automatically now when people read Black Cotton and they see her get shot, mm -hmm. like, oh, that's a female? Oh, and she's white? Oh, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> <laughs> to, that, to that point, um, I had to take, funny enough, working in corporate America, we all had to go through like this, I don't know what you would call it. It was like diversity right. training yeah. we had to go through recently. And so I had to sit through this like long presentation. And one of the activities was um, an implicit bias, bias mm. test. Mm. Right? We talk about that all the time. <laughs> and so, you know, it was like you go through a bunch of uh, scenarios. It's like, okay, black is good. White is bad or white is good. Black is bad. Uh, press this button if what you're seeing on the screen is good or bad. <clears throat> and then so it'll do it all it'll do it where all right it'll, it'll show you all like white stuff or whatever and it's like training you to say good and then it'll start showing you black people and like you're already in this mindset where you're like okay i'm gonna say this is bad and it's like oh wait i gotta stop because i'm like you know i'm seeing somebody that looks like me right like, wait that's not bad right and so your reaction time and all that kind of gives you this score for the bias. But my point in that was you see somebody that looks like you and it kind of forces you to slow down and think like, wait, what do I actually think about this? Right. right. And so that's kind of the the effect that you were speaking of, right? Where you see yourself in a certain role and it's like, okay, I want to empathize with that person, but wait, they're a bad person. Right. <laughs> right. Um, and right. I think something that's um also, you know, a thing with the with black cotton at least with volume one right because volume one is not presented in color no right? right and so because of that a lot of times like depending on how many people are in a scene you may not be able to identify their race at all right <laughs> right and so it's like i'm searching in this book like wait who's the good guy who's the bad guy i can't really tell by skin color yeah. so i gotta like really read and like really get what they're saying right as opposed to judging them from what they look like was that intentional oh yeah yeah tell them brian <laughs> <laughs> yeah like from the onset of like um after we carved out and, and and came up with what the story was going to be and we had the vehicle of the cotton family um and we mapped out what the story would be for that first six issues uh you know we immediately agreed upon black and white and it wasn't mm. black and white because that would be cheaper or whatever. It was black and white because we wanted to decolorize, like mm. to take out um, seeing this black character and this white character. Because in the log line, you know, it says this, the social order of white and black. And so right. what we wanted to um, to to focus on was that black and white before it is a color is a social order. It's, it's, a, mm. cl it's a class system. It's, it's how we're organized. Because right. at the end of the day, you know, we're all different shades of brown. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from the very light to the very dark. Uh, right. So we wanted this first story to be decolorized so that the idea of being able to use your eyes to point the finger and to go back and forth was not a question. Wow. That's awesome. I didn't realize that was the intent the whole time. Um, so while we're here, uh, Dennis Cowan's here in the chat. Um co-founder of Milestone Media. Thank you <laughs> for being here, sir. And he says he loves oh Titan Black Titan and wishes he would have thought of it. Excellent work. Guys. That's an amazing compliment. Man. Thank you. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah, that's that's wild. But no, that's, I do love the, the name, the title Black Cotton. And, and Black Cotton, it's not just like the name of the book. It's like a, a, a greeting. Yeah. What What's the meaning or if that's something that you even want to reveal. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But what, what is Black Cotton? What does it stand for? It's, it's okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is something that, uh, remember, it, 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 you're talking old money. Mm -hmm. So this family is very rooted in their history. And what you will see, the perfect example is uh, there's a scene where uh, Elijah 
Cotton, who is the father. Mm -hmm. uh, he is being stern and he's getting on Kia Cotton, who is his uh, daughter. And he's going off on her and you can see in her expression that she's down. Mm -hmm. And as she's walking out, he says, Black Cotton to her. Mm -hmm. And then she smiles and says black cotton back to him. So what it does is it is that thing that gets them back to the root. And it basically says, hey, no matter what just happened, I still love you, mm. you know? And remember, you know, black cotton, because that's where their wealth is built off of, mm. black cotton. But the whole key is above all, whatever just happened, Wipe it clean. I love you. Black cotton. And that's all she needed to hear. You know, she she was good to go. So they are continuously reminding each other, no matter what the family's going through, guess what? We all got each other's back, black cotton, except for Zion. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. He says it, but you can tell. He's yeah. not, he, he, he is not feeling black kind. <laughs> he's, he's certainly skeptical of it. Right. And, yeah. um, and, and that, that'll be revealed, you know, later on. And this is within any family, every family can relate, you know, when, uh, uh, people see what you, what you want them to see, mm -hmm. but those who are on the inside, see everything. Right. And basically he has seen the good and the bad. Right. And he's been rubbed, you know, obviously yeah. he has his own um, uh, uh, thoughts about, mm -hmm. you know, what has happened that other people don't know. But you'll learn as the story unfolds. Right. And I love that. I love the journey he's on. Right. Like, you know, he's he's questioning his own biases. Um, you know, he's in some instances kind of rebelling against the family and, and, and really just kind of trying to chart his own path right um but in some ways that could be to the detriment of the family name or the family's image um but i mean I, i'm kind of a sucker for just family intergen intergenerational play anyway um but when i was reading the series i didn't realize that it was going to be an ongoing so when i read through issue six i'm like all right man it was done that was dope that was cool like i liked it i, I feel like they could go somewhere else with it but I was satisfied, right? How how far along in this process were you like, all right, this is gonna go this many issues and we're gonna release it in this many arcs? <laughs> so, so the interesting thing is that um, like Black Cotton, you know, when you first hear what it's about, it, automatically, the, you know, the thought is it's a limited series, you know, it's gonna be like, you know, it revolves around this event, the shooting, and right. you know, we're just gonna tell the story and be done. But mm -hmm. Black Cotton was conceived, you know, to be uh an, an ongoing. Um it was conceived to be about this family. Uh mm -hmm. this, this the shooting story is an event and it, this is just how we chose to start their story. But it's a family drama. Uh, right. That's, that's going to expand uh, what we call the BCU, the Black Cotton Universe, where you know mm -hmm. you have a whole world that is reversed, and a, right. a lot is a lot is, is is not the same as it is here. Um, and so, going into Volume Two, um, you know we're going to really touch on that, and you're going to see more of this Black Cotton Universe and what this mm -hmm. this world looks like, and it, and it, where it doesn't just revolve around Zion and his shooting, right? And right is in color <laughs> yes the second arc is in color which is I on purpose some, as well <laughs> word. so yeah i've seen some preview images on twitter i probably should have pulled them in um but my man uh steven says didn't know about this till bj kicks told me i bought every issue on ebay love this story and how it's delivered cool. uh he says he's a black cop so he has a deep understanding cool. and love for the series nice oh, nice definitely appreciate that thank you all right Thank and then Kevin you. says, uh, it's relevant. A lot of families had a reckoning these last couple of years, kids questioning their parents' views. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. You know, too, in in addition to, like, the mantra of, of Black Cotton with Zion particularly, like, 
we and we have so many different conversations and that love you know encompasses like like identity like we talk about identity mm -hmm. and one thing that i think that in this real world where we are is that you know from from our history you know we've struggled with our identity you know right. constantly trying to form it and find it you know from from being called the n word to mm -hmm. uh to negroes to black to mm -hmm. african american like you know we're 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 constantly you know e evolving quote unquote and trying to solidify our identity um you know in this world they have their identity right like, they never lost people, it. they never lost it black people have their identity so mm -hmm. black cotton for the cotton family all that love is wrapped in they they've always known who they are and that right. way, like in like Patrick was saying it brings it brings them back. Hey, Black Cotton. For Zion, though, you know, he's the interesting thing is Zion has the choice, the Black privilege to lose his identity, if he wants. <laughs> mm. You know, so it's, you know, it's such a, it's such a dynamic uh, to look at when, you know, we're coming from our world to their world and then having to come back to our world after we close the book. Um, right. So we're we are definitely looking forward to doing more of that uh in volume two. So yeah. and then just uh uh going back to what Brian just said about the Zion having the choice to lose his identity, mm -hmm. guess what? He still has the choice to go back and get it. Right. <laughs> it's yeah. not lost, you know, and, and, and that is something that we especially in uh volume number one going back to why we didn't put it in color because mm -hmm. we you know as a culture we can go down a rabbit hole on why why is so and so you know that light why is so and so that dark why mm -hmm. did you know and next thing you know you'll miss everything you'll miss what was said the expressions so we felt it would be uh received mm -hmm. better if we just eliminated that, especially in volume one. Now, yeah. volume two, it is about color. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So one thing that surprised me, and I'm trying not to give too much of the story away because I know a lot of the audience hasn't read it yet. Um, and by the way, the trade paperback volume one is out now. Uh, if you look in the description of this video, there is a link to where you can purchase it on Amazon. Um, it's it's not expensive and you'll get it in a couple of days. Um, so that's dope. Um, but yeah, so the Kev loved the black and white illustrations. So he loves that approach. Yeah, nice. um, but the um, about midway through the series, there's like a um, there's a twist. There's a twist, right? Because we're reading this and you're getting this this sort of race riot kind of uh, subplot. You're getting like, okay, well, what's going to happen with the girl? What's going to happen with these charges? And then out of nowhere, we get a conflict uh, that's introduced for the Cotton family. And I don't want to really spoil from there, but that's the point where I was like, oh, like this series is about a lot more. Like, yeah. And I'm wondering if now, you know, the face value part of it, um, I don't want to say takes away from it, but I'm wondering like if people are even getting to that part. Mm. Mm. That's, that's that's a great question it it's funny um that you say like um like all of a sudden mm -hmm. boom here it is like patrick and i was talking about that because like it is it does feel that way yeah and, but like hindsight if you go back to to issue one we we set that up on the airplane we hit jalisa is coming back from japan and, she, wow. and she's having that conversation but because you make a great point and and i'm gonna add to that point because it's so hyper focused on the shooting and like i believe that to a certain to a certain degree the story itself will put into a box hmm. and i'm not mad at that box because we we packaged it we packaged it that way hmm. um and, and because it was important to start with the shooting but um from the from the onset of the story you know, the larger story is there from the very beginning. Yeah. Wow. Issue number three, what you're talking about is mm -hmm. powerful. 
uh, yeah. because it's even an issue, and I'll throw this out there, <laughs> even in the beginning of issue number three, we also introduce the equivalent word in that reality to the N word in our reality. Right. And, you know, it just comes out of nowhere. <laughs> wow. So, you know, so it's That's a right. lot that happens in issue number three. Yeah. Word. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and read the series again for sure. Um, just for some added context. This this the first issue of this came out when? February. February, February uh 17, right? Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So yeah, my my daughter was born March 20th. She's born premature, right? And oh, so congrats. um thanks, Absolutely. man. Thank you. Absolutely. So when um when this series comes out. I go from reading it monthly like everybody else to like, I got a huge stack of books, <laughs> but Brian's emailing me these advanced copies. So I'm like, all right, well, let me, let me read it. And I'm like, every issue, I'm like, yo, this is dope. Like, I can't wait yeah. to like really sit down and experience this all at once, but I still haven't bought the trade. I just got my single issues. I need to like, I want to sit and digest the story just as a single volume at, at this point. Cool. Cool. Send me your address. I'll send you one. Okay. Okay. I'll do that. And um, you know what I'll do? I'll read it. I'll sign it and we'll give it away uh, to somebody else. Um, we're, we're about to hit 5,000 subscribers. And so that'll be a part of the 5,000 subscriber giveaway. Oh, if it gets here oh, nice. I'll awesome. sign it with you, Patrick. Okay. Perfect. Nice. Double I like awesome. that. That's dope. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So paperbacks and soundtracks definitely wants to get the trade. Uh, his comic shop never got the last two issues. Oh wow! Yeah, there was something weird that happened with Lunar toward the end of the series, yeah. like five and issues five and six. It was like it had a certain release date. Yeah. They just it just didn't show up on that date. Um, yeah. I eventually got them, but yeah, I don't know what was going on with distribution then. But well, everything's yeah. been weird. Yeah, and that that uh, that was disappointing to us because yeah. of two things. Oh, well, I'll say two things, but really just one. But we didn't even know. We weren't even alerted to, you know, the delay. So mm. here we are telling people, hey, you know, it's uh, it should be coming out this Wednesday and go make sure you go get it. And then all of a sudden they're telling us, hey, it's been delayed. And we're like, how y'all know? And we don't know, you know? <laughs> and the only reason I would know is because I have to check it every week, right? Because it's like something was pushing back all the times so like right, i got to the point where i can't even trust like the secondary websites let me just go straight to the distributor and see what they've got on their list this week for the retailers wow. um but yeah, i mean we shouldn't have to do that like it should just come out when it's going to come exactly. out Agreed. or there should exactly. be communication clearly you know mm-hmm. um so my man eugene said this is a great conversation i've never read any of the issues but we'll definitely be picking up the trade appreciate you appreciate that thank you you'll love it <laughs> Kevin Carr says he's going to do the same thing. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So let us know what you think, too, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Absolutely. And so Kev asked earlier, he says, we could save this for later in the conversation. I guess it's later now. Um, but what books are you guys enjoying um, mm-hmm. you know, outside of what you're writing and stuff? You want me to go first? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I am a huge Rodney Barnes fan. So everything that Rodney puts out, I read. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I got stacks of Philadelphia. Of course, I got the trades. Uh, mm-hmm. I am hard on Nita Hawes. I don't, it's kind of taboo, but I might like Nita Hawes more than Philadelphia, which is crazy. Right. But I really like Nita Hawes. Um, I'm reading uh, all of the milestone stuff. Um, I'm reading Aquaman. Um, mm-hmm. uh, uh, no. Let me not try. Black Mantis, and I'm going into Aqua Man. Um, gotcha. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Chuck. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, what else? What else? Um, I like Once in Once in Future. Once in Future. Yeah, I've, I've been following that since day one. So I have stacks of those. I like mm-hmm. Firepower. Um, the truth. The the Department of of Truth. I'm big mm-hmm. into that. Um, I'm big into Tinian. Uh, so. Okay. Even though I, I don't I do not collect his uh something is killing, Some his, killing children. the children. I don't collect that 
in yeah. the physical, but I was collecting it on Comixology. I'm well, probably yeah. doing the physical now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, um, that's me. So that's where me and Brian flip. You know, okay. <laughs> I got you know, <laughs> I got I got damn near all of those and uh, and. Uh, the graded ones too. I got him, oh, you know, sign. You know, it's. I got a couple of issue number one. I probably spent too much on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I remember what you talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, hey, you hey, know hey. <laughs> I after I bought it, I had to go on uh go on IG and I had to put it out to the world. I was like, yo, did I overspend on this? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you, you don't. It's never overspending if you love it. Right. Yeah, there you go. Right. It's, it's like that. true. It's true. Hey, hey, you know, I, I figure in a couple of years, you know, I'll be able to, you know, uh get my money back at least, you know. Right, right. <laughs> Shoot. I saw uh the other day the one in twenty-five for the first appearance of Miles Morales is selling for like thirty thousand yeah, dollars. I, I saw insane. that too. Wow. That that's, was crazy. That's wild. That's insane. Yeah, yeah. Oh. that was wow. Right. It's a, Hey, hey, it made me feel good though. Yeah. Oh, um, you know, I have a, a Ultimate Fallout mm -hmm. uh, number four with um, uh, Stan Lee signed. You know, I got his two signatures on uh -huh. it. It's graded. You know, so I was like, hey, keep keep spending that loop. You know, right. Keep spending. Right. You know, <laughs> that's crazy. First print. First print. Wow. Yeah. That's what's up. Yeah. Now, yeah. another tag on uh, Kevin's question is, is are there any series or any books that you guys are reading or that you've seen uh that do a good job as well as tackling like tough issues similarly to black cotton what do you think about uh what was that dark blood what do you think about that one brian i didn't finish dark blood i read the first two it was uh, i liked it but it was really slow for me right um man i'm trying to think of um i like uh i like i like abbott I like right. Abbott. Okay. Um, I read um, the first volume of that and the second volume of that. And I feel like that does a great job. Uh, the art is gorgeous. Um, uh, Sammy does such a, like, oh, he, he's, he's, he's brilliant. Um, mm -hmm. The way that it's, it's, it's constructed with it being a supernatural story, but it's in the bedrock of the story um, is built upon race and you know racism and that social class in detroit at that time mm -hmm. um, and um i think that the writer does such a great job of, of of balancing the supernatural with uh the social issues that was happening in the 70s so um i'm a huge huge fan of that for how how well it's balanced right and i like i love i should say horror stuff so to mm. get that, the horror plus that um is, is 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 perfect for me so i would say abbott is probably my favorite yeah i haven't i haven't actually found one i i've seen where um they might do a issue <laughs> trying to you know uh tackle a social uh uh issue but i haven't seen one with a whole series like mm. uh, how we did it, but I invite them to, you know, try to do that, you know, instead of just, uh, uh, for instance, I, I'll say how we're seeing uh, DC sort of, you know, throw so much in right now, but they're not really, to me tackling anything. They're just trying to, uh, you know, hey, here we we got our pride, you know, cover and. Mm. You know, you know, let's let's dig deeper. Let's actually really, you know, hey, don't be afraid because yeah. I, I feel that society's ready. You know, the one thing about Black Kind that uh, we showed the timing was perfect mm -hmm. uh, and society was ready and they're still ready. You know, right. they're not as weak as you think. You know, people are ready to have real conversations. Yeah, right. I think the what you're speaking to is kind of a question of uh, representation versus maybe reconciliation, mm -hmm. right? Like if, if the goal of the story is, I want these two, to, I want these people to be able to, or these groups to be able to find common ground at the end of this, 
versus, you know, a lot of, you know, voices are like, well, we just want to see ourselves more. I don't particularly care to interface with other people who don't look like me. I just want the option of picking up a book with my face on the cover. Right. You know? And I think those are those are separate goals. And I think that's why we see the the kind of the goalposts kind of move so much. Interesting. Right. Interesting. I love that. And I think that both can happen. Like, um, for example, uh, I just thought about it. Like, I would love to see because I know that the series is over. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to see a comic book adaptation or a, a comic book continuation of Lovecraft Country. Right. That would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Like, because that show, stim- which was an adaptation, that show really, you know, brought the supernatural, the horror, you know, and really dealt with racism and social class again and mm-hmm. family drama. All of it was wrapped in, in there. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, to bring that to uh, the comic book medium would be incredible. Um, so, yeah, you bring you know, it back. It, yeah, I mean, if someone's out there trying to find something to license, that is <laughs> something that they should grab because I do think we're at the point um, in our history where in this era, in this time period, where I, I love how you phrase that. Um, mm, you said right. reconciliation and uh, uh, representation. Rec- representation, yeah. right. I was going to say recognition, but yes. Reconciliation and representation, I think that those two lanes can merge. Mm. And I think that we can do something incredible with those two lanes. Um, and, you know, shoot, through through storytelling, you know, a uh, hundred years from now, we could be in a different mind space. You know, right. there could be a huge paradigm shift. Um, mm-hmm. But we have to continue to 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 be on these these paths and and, and cross them and blend them and, mm. and see what we get. Right. But it all goes back to uh, what you were talking about earlier with the diversity mm. or diversification. Um, <clears throat> you got to have the right people in the room. Mm. You know, if you don't have the right people in the room, then guess what? Your product is going to reflect the individuals that were in the room and what they think and what they, you know, feel and see. And that I believe is the issue. You yeah. have individuals in the room who they think all the world wants is, you know, uh, recognition. You know, they just want to see, you know, Hey, I, I Oh, there you go. Which I can't lie. When I watch television, like the big bang theory, Mm-hmm. I love the Big Bang Theory, but guess what? When it was a running show, I never watched it. Why? Because mm-hmm. I ain't seen no black people. I'm like, it's a good show, but you telling me in the room, y'all, can, there's no black engineers? There, right. There's no, none? <laughs> right. Really? Come on. So I couldn't support that. That's mm-hmm. one thing. But now, just like you're saying, if you have the right people in the room, <clears throat> it's just like uh, insecure. You know, mm-hmm. Issa Rae, a phenomenal, you know, director, writer, actor. You know, I give all props to her. She made sure she had the right people in the room and a diverse, you know, um, not only cast, but also a diverse, you know, writer's room, uh, producers, all of that to ensure that those two things happen. You mm-hmm. saw, you know, recognition. You saw you. But at mm-hmm. the same token, at the end, you also could get to, you know, where there was some reconciliation. You know, you could handle, tackle some real issues. Right. Yeah. We we I talk about Milestone a lot on this channel just because I have been on this quest to uh, cre- uh, complete a full run of all the Milestone books. Right. I, j- right. I finally got the original four. So there's like a few little mini series I don't have, but I got all the static icon blood syndicate and hardware so i'm excited <laughs> about that um, congratulations on that thank yeah. you yeah thanks so through that journey i end up talking about uh diversity a lot and one thing that milestone had was that diversity right like at yeah. the top you know there was certainly there's four black men right mm-hmm. i mean five at the very beginning right but through there was such an initiative to hire a wealth of people right mm-hmm. from different backgrounds different experiences i was just talking about uh blood syndicate the other day right it's written by ivan velez who is a gay latino man yes, right 
and who was on the record of saying like, I didn't think I would have a career in comics because of that. Mm. Right. Wow. And so he gets this opportunity working for milestone and blood syndicate ends up introducing like transgender characters. And this is in 1994. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, so it's, it does speak to what you're saying about just having uh, different people in the room, right? Different uh, backgrounds, different thought levels. It's, it's not so much about, all right, I'm the black representative. I would like all black stuff, right? <laughs> but it's like, no, like, what's the world really look like? You know, yeah. like, if we all have the same opinion, we're not necessarily going to get any further, right. you know? Yeah. Um, I'll tell you something uh, real quick. That's mm -hmm. one thing I I love about, like I said, me and Brian, but just the Black kind team. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're talking Marco Perigini, you know, he, he's over in Italy, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, bro. Yeah. You, you got Marcelo Santana over in Brazil. Yeah. Wow. You know, uh, uh, Francisco. Yeah, Francisco. In Brazil. <laughs> I mean, you Very know. Like in, in Sweden. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so we also, we made sure that you know what? We wanted a, a diverse team just so we could get input. And it is so important, even just like you said at the beginning, you know, I also do it. Uh, I do music, you know, and um, just released the, uh, my second album, Psalms 117, uh, March 11th. Okay. And what you will see is that I always leave room for creativity. Mm -hmm. I understand these individuals are just geniuses in their own right you know this mm. musician guess what that's what he or she trained you know all these years to do so who am i to stifle that you know so i yeah. always make sure they got creativity you know range and that's what me and brian do with our team you know hey yeah. marco put your little spin in it you know i yeah. mean that's what you do marcelo and and that is you know um going back to what you were saying, you know, having the right people in the room, you know, is huge because if you do that, then you can really put out a product that people love. Because right. It's not just your product. It's right. Our product. Absolutely. Um, so speaking of the team and the diversity of the team, Kev asked how you guys became partners. I know you, you covered that earlier in the show, um, but I guess I'd add to that. How did the whole team come together? Mm, go ahead, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so uh once patrick and i linked up um and you know we actually took everything that we you know went from mind to paper and began to organize the paper and, and you know in in synopsis and outlines um i was working with marco um on a web comic um mm. and I've, I've known marco for a few years and um and so I was talking to Patrick about Marco and Patrick was familiar with um, the web comic. And mm. I was like, look, Marco, he, his, his style can vary. You know, he's, he's very flexible. He's like, uh, he, he's just an accomplished artist, you know, his mm. skill set. And so I, I like, you know, do you want to see what he can do with the character and, and do some, some character concepts? And Patrick was all in on it. So uh, we approached Marco with it. he, Came back with the concepts. We were like, it's a go. Uh, and from there, you know, um, Francisco was uh, someone that I, Francisco is a letterer, and he was someone that I have worked with on on some books uh, for other smaller publishers. And so uh, I, I trusted him. He, he had, you know, he's professional. He does great work. Uh, showed him to Patrick. He was a go. And so mm -hmm. um, the, the extension from, Patrick and I went out to like just people that I I've known, um, in, you know, in my going to and fro within the comic book community. Uh, yeah, except for uh, Marcelo. And, and Marcelo was. Yeah, I brought Marcelo yeah. to the team. Uh, you know, I saw his work and, you know, we're always that's one thing about me and Brian. We're always looking for that uh, untapped gem. Mm. out there just people who you know are honing their craft putting it out there and you can see you're like something special about this person mm. you know and so i saw his work and i just reached out to him i said hey mm. yo man oh uh, 
how much you charge, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he's been phenomenal. That was such a great final on Patrick's part. I mean, he, <laughs> like, he, like, this team, it kind of just came together, you know? And mm. um, and they every single person, you know, contributes and and we all collaborate and it brings forth, you know, the best, the best product. And yeah, Marcelo is on colors now for us for volume two. And you gotcha. know, he truly was a gem. So and Patrick, man, yeah, that was a great time. Yeah. yeah. And he he did uh um I think uh yeah, most of the variant covers mm -hmm. uh gotcha. for, yeah. for black kind. So we we wanted uh uh Marco to be able to focus you know on uh the artwork and just you know really hone hone in on that and kudos to Marco um he really embodies black time he does you know i mean yeah. he puts in he truly understands black kind and you can see it in his artwork because he'll send stuff back and even me and Brian, we were like, oh, snap, the poster in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. let me do that. I'm going to share my screen. There's a You guys posted a preview on Twitter of uh, just, just one panel from uh, the, this upcoming volume. So let's see. I can share that so you guys can see. This is what it's going to look like here in color. Now, the, the title of volume two. Black cotton, white on white crime, and the plight of gentrification. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Man. So, I mean, that's saying a lot right there in the title. What can we expect coming out of volume two? <laughs> oh. Uh, well, here, here's what I would we'll start. say before, you know, uh, I let Brian take over. Mm -hmm. Is uh, as soon as you hear white on white crime, oh, uh, doesn't it make you think of black on black crime, that phrase? Yeah. And the question we've always asked, what is black on black crime? Mm -hmm. You know, because if you look at statistics where you live, if you live in a black neighborhood, statistically, um, it's going to be most of the crime that happens is going to be, you know, black on black. If you live in a white neighborhood, same thing. It's right. not that black people go out of their mm -hmm. way to a white neighborhood to, you know, commit crime. It ain't that white people go out their way to go to a black neighborhood or, you know, any culture. So right. black on black crime really is not a thing. Crime is crime. That's all it right. is. So that's right. really where that's um, the white on white crime, we're going to, you know, tackle that issue. Mm -hmm. And, um, in this volume because there's no such thing as black on black crime white on white crime agent you know <laughs> and there's no such thing as that crime is crime period right right I um i mean i love just this dialogue here what happened here nothing new it's another white boy that like it sounds like something off of maybe like the wire or like law and order or something right, right? but it's, it's flipped and it's so interesting because again you, you read this and it sounds routine, right? But then you're just like, wait, why is this routine to me? Like, why why am I so used to this? You know, so I, I love the subversive nature of the series and that carries through like the whole time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with volume two, um, like Patrick was saying, you know, we are, um, well, so the bigger picture of volume two is that volume two is actually 12 issues. And okay. It's, it's it's a big story. Uh, we we wanted to come back with um uh, with a, a continuation, but for that continuation to also have its own story that that comes about from what happened in, in volume one. Hmm. So it's a continuation, but it's its own story as well. And so you're going to find the cottons a year later, and hmm. so you're going to find out where they're at and who they are now and how things have either, you know, regressed or have progressed. And mm -hmm. um, the way that is going to be split up is we're doing um, book one, book two, and book three. Uh, mm -hmm. So volume two will be three, three, three sections of books. Um, gotcha. Because the story is, you know, is, is, is just a larger story. Um, and like 
Patrick said, you know, we're uh, it's, it's, it's in color uh, because white on white crime play off of black on black crime. You know, mm. this story is about color. Right. Um, and the plight of gentrification, you know, we're going to look at 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 uh, how that happens mm. um, and even how it connects to crime and how it connects to um, uh to the people in power, and we all, we know that the Cottons are in power, and so right. through through this story, you're going to really see the Cottons at work, and you're going wow. to um, see who they are even more so um, than in Volume One, because we really got a glimpse mm-hmm. of who they are in Volume One. In in Volume Two, you're really going to get like the Cottons' story as mm-hmm. they weave in and out of. Um, the white on white crime and the plight of gentrification while expanding, right, Patrick? I really yeah. to expand, <laughs> uh, expand the universe. So wow. that's that's wild. It's funny because um, I'm I, I'm I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, right? Mm-hmm. And where I am, or like where I grew up, going to church, right? Mm-hmm. Growing up, it was always the hood. Like <laughs> like there was literally bullet holes in the side of the church because there was a drive by once when I was a kid. Right. I went off to college, came back, got married. You know, we're 10 years removed. And now the neighborhood around the church is completely flipped. So we've gone through, you know, the urban decay, the revitalization, the city planning. And now we're at the stage where it's like, all right, there's a seven hundred thousand dollar house on every corner. And like, that is insane. It is insane to, like, look at this neighborhood Mm -hmm. like. Um, I was driving Uber once. This was a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. and I uh, I see the address. I'm like, what? What? And I pick up. It's this white lady. She's got her little Starbucks, like the leggings. It's the, it's the whole whole stereotypical getup. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, I'm going to this uh this spot, this movie theater. I'm like, oh okay. And I pull up to the movie theater. And I'm like, yo, this used to be a Win Dixie, and there was a hair salon right here that my mom used to get her hair done at. Wow. And you never wanted to be here at night. And here we are. <laughs> At 10 o'clock, I'm dropping you off for a late night show. That was uh, wild to me. Um, (laughs) And so because of that, I've been looking and studying like gentrification and and, and how these things happen. And so this is particularly interesting to me to get into volume two and see the Cotton's role in this community. Um, And I mean, I don't want to, obviously I can't spoil anything. I haven't read it, but it's like, you know, when you, when you look at the real world parallels, you can kind of guess in certain aspects where the story is going. Um, so I'm excited to see that play out. Yeah. And, and, and here's what I, I think is going to happen. Uh, just like with me and Brian doing our research, you know, on uh, gentrification and just preparing to uh, do this volume two, I started looking around where I live. I live in Stafford, Virginia. Mm. And I started looking, I was like, it's happening right here. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, what the heck, man? Because when when we got here, you know, me and my wife, we we bought our townhouse for um it was a uh, 260, 265. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, they build in townhouses, townhouses starting at like 615 That's and crazy. all the houses around us, you know, is, <clears throat> is six starting at the mid 600s. Mm-hmm. It's like, what the, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> where is all this money coming from? Where right. are these people, you know, coming from? But my biggest thing, I had a conversation with a friend and, um, what he didn't understand, but I, I think he got it at the end. Uh, he was like, hey, if they can't afford it, you know, then guess what? They got to go somewhere else. And I told him, I said, well, well, let me ask you this. I said, when you go to that shopping center right down the road, I said, you're expecting somebody to be there, right, to service you. And you want them to have a smile on their face, right? Mm-hmm. I said, well, think about this. If they had to drive an hour to get to work, how do you think they're going to feel when they get to work? Right. They ain't going to be happy to service you, you right. know? And then they got to drive an hour to go home just to get affordable housing. 
Mm-hmm. When guess what? When they're building all these homes, they should have also built affordable housing. So these individuals who are servicing you don't have to drive, you know, so far just to get to a minimum wage job. Right. You got to think about that. You want all those services. Well, guess what? You know, you, you need to make sure that they are able to live among you. Right. Right. So Kevin wants to know, he says, how many issues are in the first volume? It's, it's a six issue trade paperback, right? Correct. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. So, uh, so I wanted to say season two, but volume <laughs> two is coming out um, as you said, it's basically the content of 12 books, but you're splitting it into three. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. So three books. Um, three. So it'll be, so it'll, it'll be, 12 issues. So okay. It'll still, it'll still come out as single issues. Uh, okay. One through four, five, five through eight, nine through 12. Um, but it would be in trades as one through four. So you'll have three different trades. And uh, and hopefully we're going to have a one through 12 hardback compendium. That's right. What we're, okay. That's what we're looking for. So yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm definitely looking out for that. I'm a big hardcover fan. Um, cool. Same. Look, because I, I got kids, man. Like I, I need my books to be able to take a little bit of a beating if they need to, you know. Um, so, what's the release schedule looking like? We uh, right now it hasn't been decided. You know, we got to go through the scout uh, schedule and also, you know, so so we're we're you know we're just pumping, pumping okay. through, you know, and uh, uh, but. As soon as we, you know, know, guess what? We're going to put it out. We'll make sure you know. So okay. that, um, yeah. uh, but we're going to also have some treats for people uh, along the way, you know. So yeah. we're working on that. But we're also going to, you know, probably work on some, uh, some maybe some one shots or something to give people more, you know, insight to the uh, BCU, Black Kind Universe. Okay. Um, definitely. Uh, let people understand more characters that are uh, within it. Uh, shoot, man, we got a lot planned for the people. So uh, we're excited about this. We sure. really, really are. Got you. And you keep referencing the BCU, so now I have to ask, right? Are are there plans for more spinoff titles, another spinoff ongoing maybe? <laughs> we, well, yeah, well, yes. 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 We, we have talked about it. Um, it it's, it's it's in our uh, it's in our Bible, like okay. our Bible characters, and it's in our it's in our outlines. It's it's in all the paperwork. Um, okay. You know, it's just getting to that place um, yeah. where it's it's time to branch these characters off, and we already know who they are. So it's just right. getting right. there. Yeah, we already also know what Volume Three is. Yeah. Uh, you know, gonna be because. You know, we've already mapped that out. So, so we we stay ahead. I, I'll tell you something funny. Okay. Uh, me and Brian was talking the other day, and I was like, I was like, "Dang, man, that's out to 2030. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed just like that too. Right. But I mean, you have to you have to be able to plan like that, right? That because that just makes for better storytelling. There's a lot of times where you're reading a book and you can kind of tell, right? Like even someone as great as uh, as James Tynan, right? Mm-hmm. So he he writes he's writing Batman and he's told he's writing the Joker War and that's pretty much it, right? But then the series takes off. DC is like, all right, well. You're just the writer now. And you can kind of tell if you go back and read those those books, they're good, but you can tell he didn't really know like where he wanted to take it. Right. And then all of a sudden he's off the title, right? So you got to be able to do that, that planning and that story building uh, long term. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll tell, tell you a that. series that is uh, sort of uh, that same uh, thought pattern. Uh, and I give him a lot of kudos, uh, uh, 50 Cent. You know, power. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, the whole series and how he spun off with the sun, you know. And here's what I will say. The one that um <laughs> the one that me and my wife still struggle to get through is book number two, you know, with, uh mm-hmm. number uh three with mm-hmm. uh, uh Raising Cain, you mm-hmm. know, 
this one that's going on right now mm -hmm. um, with Tommy. Oh man, if y'all haven't jumped on that, oh, man, Tommy ain't no joke. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my man Kev says, if you guys need more great artists, once you branch the story out, check out Lamar Matherin. I hope I'm saying that right. Oh, yeah. Cowboy. Did, did the art on Cowboy Bebop. Oh. All right. Um, let's see. Now there, I know we're, we're coming up on time. I want to, you know, overstay the welcome. But um, Brian, so you've been in comics for a little bit. You, you've been a writer. You've been an editor. Um, and someone was asking, I was trying to find the comment, but it's, it's a little long gone now, but someone was asking like maybe for tips you have for up and coming writers. And I'm curious to hear like, what's your approach, right? Cause Patrick comes to you with an idea. Of course you guys riff off of each other, but what's your approach to sort of refine an idea and bring it up, bring it up to, you know, the quality that you would expect in a finished book. Um, wow. So over time, my my process has 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 changed. It's it's, it's grown um, from a, a lot of it. To be honest with you, uh, when I began working with Mad Cave um, as an editor, you know, um, they were going into into Diamond. Mm -hmm. um, it was their first year, and just working with you know. Mark London, you know, the CEO, like the writer um, and seeing, you know, his scripts and then, um, you know, the art and just looking at the whole construction of of what it takes to make a comic book and for it to go um, into traditional publishing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as Matt Cave has, has grown, you know, more writers coming in um, and, and looking at their scripts and working with them. Um, you know the process of building a, a story really starts with um the the concept right mm -hmm. and it is the the event what event is happening right and within that event you're going to have um a, what what action is flowing to make the event happen and your action has to come from a, a character and so you go from event to to the action to the character because the character has to drive the action to make the event take place and the meaning of the story comes from the obstacle and mm. so there has to be an obstacle placed in front of your character mm. um and so that's kind of the uh the the formula um and and my sub stack is named really after that i actually taught um i used to teach so mm -hmm. i taught english for 17 years and so I used to teach uh, character plus obstacle equals story. And so when I began working with Mad Cave, you know, all of that was there and, and I saw it in what they were doing. And over, over the time of being an editor and writing, um, I've, I've taken the character plus obstacle equals story and put that on paper in the form of um, a concept, a log line, hmm. a summary, and in that summary, you're telling the story. You want to capture the concept in the character and obstacle in that log line, three, four, five sentences maybe. Mm -hmm. But then you want to be able to tell the story all the way out in a summary, you know, from beginning to end. Um, you know, don't try to hide the story from yourself. Don't try to hide the story from, you know, who you're pitching the story to or who you're trying to sell the story to. Tell mm -hmm. the full story out so that you know the story before you even start scripting. Gotcha. And after you have that story out, um, then you want to outline it. You know, mm -hmm. you work through how you want it to look in comic book form as like page number here, like what page should, should this take place on? Um, and just outline it out for the comic book scripting. And from that outline, you go into scripting. So basically, when, by, by the time you get to um, to scripting, you know, the scripting part is easy because you spent so much time with the story. You spent time with the characters. You mm -hmm. know the event and you know how the characters are going to drive the action towards the event. So the scripting just becomes like just icing on the cake. So if you're starting off writing, like that's the process. Just gotcha. Walk that out completely. That's wild. I've never attempted to write 
anything besides like a research paper or an essay or something, right? And when people describe the writing process, I'm it's so weird because like I'm a content creator. I make you I can make YouTube videos all day, right? <laughs> I can I'm like, all right, I'm gonna tell you about this character. I'm gonna research this and, and do that. But like just coming up with a story and fleshing that out is great. That just sounds like 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 you guys are geniuses that are able to do that. That's oh, I- I, I I appreciate that, but like we 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 all have our thing. Like I can't do what you do, so uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's so funny. I read like maybe maybe like a month ago where um the word genius originally wasn't applied to people being. It was originally applied to people have a genius, like what they did. Mm-hmm. And so since since then, every time I hear it, I always think that now. And like you have a genius and. I have a genius. It's 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 that skill set that we we have. You know, it's only here lately that we become to think like you know we are geniuses. But right, it really is all about you know what what your gift or your skill set is. So gotcha. I can't do what you do, brother. Uh, appreciate it, man. Yeah, for sure. So, um, my man Kevin wants to know if you guys are doing any cons in the Michigan area, um, or I guess in general. I know we hit some uh, last year and we want to hit some this year. So uh, it's definitely in our future. We went to, you know, MegaCon last year and Awesome Con went to a couple uh, uh, in the, the local area, Richmond and mm-hmm. DC, you know, but um, uh, definitely that's on our radar too. Yeah. You know, this yeah. whole, whole up and down, you know, yeah. Uh, thing is, it's crazy. You know, we just want things to get, you know, back to uh, <laughs> normalcy. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I'm. Um. I'm. I don't know. I still haven't decided if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make my first trip to a con this year. I know they're doing Heroes Con in Charlotte. I think in June. Um. So I I, I still don't know if I'm gonna make my way out there. Um. My LCS hosts uh, North Carolina Comic Con. And I think I'm going to try to make an appearance there if I don't get to go to uh, Heroes Con. Um, And Toyama Displays just say he needs to get he needs to get you guys to NC for NC Comic Con. Uh, (laughs) All right, yay! Listen, so it's not too far. No, so I haven't done a con in like all the places that Patrick named. He was there. I was leery to step out, Mm -hmm. Um, and I have been. You know, um, when the pandemic happened, you know. I said, I'm like, yo, we're not going to get to anything somewhat normal until about 2022. Yeah. And, mm. and, and I said, you know, I'm I'm probably not going to be doing anything until 2022. And so, you know, I've I've it's definitely in my view. Mm. Um, I, I I I'm I'm thinking I want to do something with Baltimore Heroes Con. I was thinking about, but <clears throat> it's already it's already April, so right. Um, I'm I'm thinking maybe. Baltimore, um, and I definitely want to do New York. So mm. those are the two that uh, I think I'm going to finally come out the house for. <laughs> got you. Yeah. yeah, I haven't left the house. <laughs> we had the pandemic. My wife got pregnant during the pandemic, and then we had a NICU baby. So we've been in the house two wow. years straight. So it's like, all right, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta do something. Yeah, I understand. I understand. And and the world is a little bit safer you know yeah. it's not it's not back to what it was and i don't think we'll ever get all the way back to where it was anyway so mm-hmm. it's all about trying to find out how do we live in this new normal right, Jeez, right. I'm doing, isn't it crazy it, or maybe it's just me because me and my wife was talking about it but you know how we had this whole you know era i'll say where we were masked up right uh-huh and now when you go out and you see somebody with a mask on you're like, what's wrong with you? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. They always look at me because I still wear masks. Right? Yeah, yeah. My mm-hmm. wife do too. You know, yeah. but but it's still, you know, it, you're like, am I wrong or that? What, 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 right. You know, yeah. you do question a little bit. Yeah. You what's know? your thought? <laughs> my my daughter, like, even like, because you know, we've begun to go into some some restaurants. Like, she she refuses to take it off all the way. She will wear it down here. <laughs> Uh huh. And like you should bring her down here to eat. Put it down there. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's like, do funny. you, girl? Do you? Right. Yeah. Now they just they just um 
stop the match. I mean, I'm in North Carolina. You know, whatever regulation they can take away, they're gonna take it away quickly. Yeah. So, um, True. but yeah, they just took masks out of the schools. Mm-hmm. So my daughter's not wearing a mask to school. So at that point, it's like, well, what are we wearing them for anywhere? Like, if anybody's gonna get sick and bring germs home, it's gonna be her. Yeah, right. Um, so the kids, we're not super stringent on wearing the mask. For me, though, I told my wife this. I'm like, yo, I don't like. I'm, I like that I have to like talk to people. I have my mask on. You know what I'm saying? If it's cold outside. It keeps my face warm. Like yep. there's all these benefits to the mask. I'm gonna be sad to see it go. <laughs> I keep one in the pocket. <laughs> or, or, well, guys, um, I wanted to shout out while we're here, uh, Mad Cave Studios, Brian, where you are, uh, an editor. Because first, I don't even. I mean, you obviously have a a firm grasp on story and keeping a story straight and to be able to edit a universe of titles like this, like that's, that's wild. So um, if you guys want to support uh, or if people, if the audience wants to support you guys, where, where should they be going? Well, definitely. Uh, yeah, definitely. We got a website that we're still, you know, in the process of uh, populating, but it's out there. So definitely sign up because uh You'll find out the uh, latest and greatest on Black Kind Volume 2 and many other things, but uh, blackkindcomic.com. That's the website. You can definitely hit us up on there. You can get Black Kind merchandise from uh, Society6, which is also on our website, the link to it. Uh, If you, you know, uh, love gospel music, Definitely just uh, Google my name, Patrick Foreman. Uh, latest album just came out, you know, uh, Psalms 117 with uh, Angelica Baylor, uh, mm. Michelle Prather, uh, Richard Davis, to one great, all of them legendary in the game. Uh, yes. Phenomenal individual. So uh, just enjoy, you know. And uh, we also got an IG, uh, Black Kind. Uh, comic on IG, hit us up, you know, uh, follow us. We, we, we definitely trying to, uh, just keep everybody, uh, connected in the black kind family. Absolutely. So, uh, whenever we get series details for volume two, you guys, I'm definitely going to make sure you guys are the first to know, um, as soon as I find out, (laughs) um, and, uh, with audience just wants to say, thank you for your time. Uh, my man E. Johnson just went and bought volume oh, one. <laughs> so, so, yeah, guys, if you are looking, uh, if you like what you heard tonight, uh, there's a link in the description where you can order Black Cotton volume one on Amazon. Make sure you go to blackcottoncomic.com. Get yourself some merchandise. I'm plotting on a hoodie myself. Um, <laughs> you know, I missed the fact that there was a bunch of variant covers. So now I got to go find some of these covers for black cotton. So I don't know if I got to go on eBay. I got to hit with some of these Facebook groups. Um, but you guys, thank you so much. Um, Brian, thank you for reaching out to me and, and for being supportive. Um, and thank you as well, thank Patrick, you. Um, for both of you guys for your time and for this series. It's, it's a dope story. Um, and I've loved reading it. So thank you guys. Appreciate thank you. you. It's, Appreciate it's you. great black chatting black. it up and, and, and having us and, and supporting. You know, we we support each other. Iron Shopper and Iron. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, So you guys are welcome back anytime. If you want to come talk about volume two after some of that story has been uh, let out, we can do that. Um, But we'll all stay in touch, of course. Definitely. Send me your address and we'll get your books out this week. Okay. All right. I'll do that. Uh, Well, thank you guys again. And um, we'll talk soon. All right, brother. All right. Peace. Yeah, uh, Trey, I'm definitely going to hit them up with uh, some K Squad merchandise as well. I gotta order some for myself. I bought the 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 disapproved mug, and I didn't even buy like myself a hoodie or anything. You got the hat, and um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of K Squad merchandise. So I have to make that change. So I'll send some of that out as well. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna hit Patrick up after we're done streaming. Now, before I end this, first I want to say thank you guys uh, for watching the show. Another thanks to Brian and Patrick for uh, coming up and talking and having a great, genuine conversation with us. Um, 
it's it's really dope. So again, Black Cotton Volume One is available on Amazon right now. You can go ahead and let your comic shop know you want Black Cotton on your pull list. So whenever Volume Two does start to come out, you'll have that available as well. Um, a huge shout out to our sponsor, uh, Ultimate Comics, uh, for you know for making this show possible. Uh, you can go to ultimatecomics.com and shop for exclusive variants and all of those things uh, as usual. Um, but yeah, man, I appreciate you guys hanging out with us. I appreciate you guys watching the show. I will be right back here next Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, am I canceling the show? Nah, my wedding anniversary is Monday, but I'm not canceling the show. I'll see you guys next Thursday. Um, I appreciate you. You know what to do. I hope you saw something you liked in this video. If not, that's cool. Uh, you can always buy what you like. Just make sure you read what you buy. And be nice to others, because kindness makes the world go round. Peace. Always do this. Always forget to like navigate to this little thing. I'll see you guys.